welcome to uh, welcome everybody back. Uh, I hope you were able to uh, grab grab a fast lunch in the uh, kitchen. I guess um, I wanted to um, also just remind you that any questions that you have, please use the chat button. And at the end of uh, Professor Campanella's uh, uh, presentation, I will uh, relay all the questions to the chat button situation. And uh, you can add, add questions as we go along. I, I'm able to read them. OK. So in introducing Dr. Campanella, let me say this. And I'll read this because I, <laughs> I took the time to write it. At each of our past city-specific uh, 19th century baseball interdisciplinary symposiums, there have been two components to set these symposium, symposiums apart from our annual Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference in Cooperstown. First, while the FRED, which is the Frederick Ivor Campbell Conference, is wide open to any presentation on 19th century baseball, the symposiums are restricted to 19th century baseball as it occurred in a specific city or geographical locale. Second, Non-baseball historians are invited to give a non-baseball historical glimpse of either that specific city or general locale and or some aspect of 19th century life, which in turn provides a backdrop to 19th century baseball. This is the interdisciplinary component of these symposiums. This year, we are pleased and delighted to have Cornell University Professor Thomas J. Campanella as our interdisciplinary keynote speaker. At first glance, one might think that a professor teaching urban design with a bent on history at a college, even Cornell in Ithaca, New York, is somewhat out of place in discussing Brooklyn, even from a historical perspective, but this is hardly the case. You see, Professor Campanella is not only a native of Brooklyn, having deep roots in the borough, the city of churches, but he and his wife still reside there spring time in Ithaca. But more germane to this, his chosen profession or place of, of, of residency or the happenstance of his nativity, Professor Campanella has written what is the definitive history of Brooklyn. You need not take my word for it or Tom Gilbert's word for it as we both read Brooklyn, The Once and Future City, 2019, Princeton University Press. I don't hold that book up for a moment because it has such a enthralling cover. <laughs> I I had to marvel at um, what is that thing, you know? And it, it almost happened. It almost became real, and it got very close to being real in Coney Island. Um, but you don't have to take mine or or, or uh, Tom's word for it. But take the word of America's most one of America's most acclaimed historians, Pulitzer Prize winner Mike Wallace. No, not the guy from the TV show, supposed to ah. minutes. <laughs> but the distinguished professor of history from the City University of New York. Uh, and by the way, Professor, I attended John Jay where Tom did teach, uh, uh, who co authored Gotham, the history of the city in New York in 1898. That was the same year the city of, of Brooklyn was finally consolidated into one of the five boroughs that make up Greater New York City today. Wallace said when referring to Dr. Campanella's book, quote, a terrific piece of work, easily the best book on the history of Brooklyn. And that's on the front cover of the jacket, no less, not the back. <laughs> so uh, it, it's kind of official. So uh, I wish to uh, I wish Dr. Campanella had written this book 50 years ago, and I read it 50 years ago <laughs> because I was a, a young police officer walking a beat and riding around in patrol cars in various Brooklyn neighborhoods uh, for a few years before I went on with my career. But uh, so I, and so many of those neighborhoods came to life in a different perspective uh, through Dr. Campanella's book. So without further ado. Welcome, uh, Dr. Cavanaugh. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate that that um, that introduction. Um, 
I paid Mike Wallace a thousand dollars for that comment. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you're gonna have to uh, let me know when I should shut up because I have a tendency to run on. Um, I think I have till about 340, 345, is that right? Uh, yes, that's about right, that's correct. Let me just uh, double check it for you. Yes, you can go to about 340 without no problem. And we have a break, a little bit, a 10 minute break after that. So if you spill over a couple of minutes, it's fine. <laughs> okay, and I, I take it you, you, you all can hear me. Um, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <clears throat> so yeah, I, I'm gonna talk about Brooklyn in the 19th century, which is obviously an enormous subject. Um, it is the century in which Brooklyn went literally from a collection of rural villages and a tiny little town uh, close to the East River to um, consolidating itself into the city of Brooklyn in, in 1834 and, um, and then becoming uh, really one of the great cities in the United States. Um, this is, you know, before, as Peter noted, the consolidation of the, the city of New York and the conversion, if you will, of Brooklyn into a borough. Brooklyn was the third or fourth largest city, depending on who you uh, consult, uh, in much of the 19th century and had an enormous um, sense of itself and a, um, a kind of um, scrappy uh, kid brother attitude toward Manhattan, which of course I'll refer to as New York because New York was Manhattan prior to consolidation, Manhattan and part of the Bronx. And, um, and so, you know, it wrecked Brooklyn, and its leadership and its, you know, its, its, um, uh, its, its kind of aristocracy re recognized, um, as did ordinary Brooklynites, that New York was the, the big brother, but uh, it wasn't going to let that elder sibling get away with much. So whatever New York did, Brooklyn, through much of its history, especially in the second half of the 19th century, um, really uh, had to try to one-up New York, right? And you have this wonderful relationship, a very fruitful um, competitiveness in this period. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that all comes to a close literally at the stroke of midnight um, uh, in 1898, uh, when the city of New York is established um, and consolidation uh, becomes a, a fact. Um, can you still hear me? I, I noticed Peter's box is highlighted as the speaker box, but I guess that's maybe because I'm I'm speaking on my own computer. We we can hear you, yeah. Oh, good, okay, okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Great, so I'm gonna switch over to uh, share my screen um, and, and, and show you some uh, images here. And I wanna, you know, I wanna just give some, general background. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see here. You would think after two years of doing this, I'd know what I was doing, but um, okay. <clears throat> Can you um, see my lead slide there? Okay, so this is, um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the evolution. And, and I will say that um, I am not a, is someone else um, uh, driving here? Because I keep seeing um, people coming into the weight room. Peter, are you taking care of that? I'll just ignore those. You can um, so, ignore. You can ignore, ignore those. I made you co-host, so you're going to see oh, okay. those. Okay, so someone That's else. So you can. I'm taking right. care of it. Yeah. yeah, but someone else is admitting them. Um, so I, I, you know, I will say I'm not a baseball historian, despite my love of the game uh, and my name, uh, which of course is, um, you know, Campanella. This here is Roy Campanella, uh, to whom I um, possibly am related, but if so, it's way back in the old country, because uh, he grew up in Philadelphia, actually. So there's not any known connection between my family and his 
uh, here in um, in um, the uh, in the United States. So Brooklyn, um, I'm sure most of you or all of you are familiar with the geography, but I want to just give a little bit of background here. Brooklyn is at the uh, at the westernmost end of Long Island. I often refer to it as the, the um, rump of Long Island. And Long Island is a, um, uh, no offense to those of you who grew up in any part of um, Long Island, but Long Island is this pile of crap that is, was left when the great um, Wisconsin ice sheet, which you see in this wonderful mid-century model from, um, from the Bear Mountain Museum, uh, you see the, the ice sheet came down to about the latitude of New York City and then reversed itself. And it actually did that twice. And if you can imagine like a, um, a caterpillar, you know, um, pushing a bulldozer, pushing a pile of earth and then reversing, uh, and you'd leave that pile of earth. That's, that is how Long Island came to be. Uh, and the high spine of Long Island is the, you know, the, the actual terminal moraine. This is a model that um, a student of mine made for me, a digital model with, with the elevation exaggerated a little bit, but you can see this is the high point of that of the um, of that pile of of uh, detritus left behind by the glaciers, um, and uh, and this is the Harbor Hill Moraine here. And I'm just showing you this because this glacial past um, really helps chart the history of Brooklyn and its development. Um, Brooklyn really develops in a way that it's, it's, if you can imagine how New York developed, how Manhattan developed from the deep south part of it, right? Around the, the Ford of, of New Amsterdam, and then it grew north, right? And in fact, the term downtown and uptown are New York terms, right? That, that, that term downtown started with Manhattan because it was down on the map, maps generally being oriented north-south with north at the top. Well, Brooklyn reverses New York's polarity, if you will. Brooklyn starts in the north here, if you could see my cursor, and over time extends south. Um, what happens is up till about the turn of the century, maybe 1915, around World War I, most of the development is north of the terminal moraine, and, or crawling up the northern flank of the terminal moraine. And it's not until the 19, the great 1920s building boom, that you have residential development spill over into the what I call Deep South Brooklyn. And and to go back a bit, this is a view looking from say oh you know high above the Verrazano Bridge, looking um, straight east over Brooklyn toward Queens. So so this is what it looks like by the 1930s. And so there's this, not, this very handy cleaving of the geography of Brooklyn that is, is useful for understanding its development over time. You've got the terminal moraine and the outwash plain, right? And these are very different parts of Brooklyn um, and have very different, and, and there's an interesting, um, an interesting uh, relationship here. The relationship between this part of Brooklyn, downtown and the, the, the northern, north of the terminal moraine, the relationship to Manhattan is similar to the relationship between the outwash plain part of Brooklyn and the terminal moraine part, right? So there's this, you know, Brooklyn here looks to Manhattan as the arbiter all, of all things. And in many ways, this portion of Brooklyn looks to the northern part of Brooklyn in a similar um, way. So you've got this center edge condition setting up. And this persists to, to this day. I, I'm sure many of you are um, familiar with Brooklyn and, and the, the enormous amount of gentrification that's occurred there in the last 30 years or so. Um, this, this is actually an interesting map by Jeffrey Lynn, which shows um, a kind of catastrophic future in which um, you know, all of New York City is inundated by sea level rise, but it's useful because you could see the terminal moraine here, right? Um, and then on, the, on that map, what I did is I mapped um, 
cafes, bookstores, and art galleries. And I thought I had mapped yoga studios too. But anyway, these I see as good sort of indicators of gentrification. And you can see these little dark dots here are all clustered 90% above the terminal moraine, right? So this is so-called brownstone Brooklyn, right? This is the part of Brooklyn where, you know, buying a studio apartment will set you back a million dollars. And this vast outwash plain is the other Brooklyn. This is the Brooklyn um, that is, uh, you know, is off most um, maps um, of the, you know, the trendy and the twee and the hip and the cool, right? And it's also still fairly affordable. Um, of course, there were Prior to European settlement and colonization, this was a place that was inhabited for thousands of years by the native peoples. This is one of the earliest, if not the earliest map of the New York, uh, future New York City area. It, it, this map is actually sitting quote unquote on its side because North is to the right here. So here's lower Manhattan with the uh, Fort Amsterdam. And this here is Brooklyn. And there are a number of little drawings here of longhouses indicating um, the many settlements of Lene Lenape peoples in this um, part of, of Long Island, right? Here's, here's an example. This is Gerritsen Inlet, um, and, and this is in the far southern portion of, of Brooklyn. Um, <clears throat> that's Manhattan way out on the skyline there. Um, this is Marine Park, and this right over here was actually the site of one of the largest of these Native American settlements. Um, there, are, there were archaeological ex excavations done there um, over the years, uh, starting in the 1970s, and this is a, a, pot, potter, a pottery shard from one of those excavations that dates back probably about a thousand uh, years. Many of these villages were, most of them were seasonal camps, but after the arrival of the Dutch and then the English, they became permanent settlements. And the reason why is that the Dutch initially and then the English basically um, convinced these native tribes to begin producing wampum at these village sites year round. Um, and selling the wampum to the Dutch and English, who then would take it up the river, up the North River, the Hudson River, um, to use to trade with the uh, native tribes in the northern part of the state for beaver pelts. Those beaver pelts were then shipped to Europe for hats and other clothing items. So there was this, this trade cycle that um, sets into motion. And we were talking about this, um, this portion uh, of Brooklyn here, and there were a number of Native American sites, a very important wampum pr um, production sites, uh, which is what made the, the southern part of Brooklyn so such, of such interest to the Dutch. It wasn't the productive farmland. Um, it was these wampum production sites. Anyway, this is a drawing of, um, if we, dial forward uh, 50 years or so. Um, this is uh, a map of Brooklyn showing the small villages that evolved over time in the, in the, um, in the 17th and 18th centuries. New Utrecht, Flatbush, Flatlands, um, um, Canarsie, New Lots, right? So you have, it, it's a, this, and then of course, Brooklyn proper is up here. And, and again, you see, this is the terminal moraine here, right? And you don't even need to look at a top, topographic map to know, to map in a sense, the moraine. You just need to look at place names, right? So you've got Bay Ridge, you've got um, uh, Park Slope, you've got Brooklyn Heights, you've got Crown Heights, right? So it's, it's in the name, the nomenclature and the place names. In any case, this is um, Brooklyn, the evolving uh, city. And then you've got this collection of rural villages. Um, one of which, Gravesend here, is of particular interest because it was the one English town in Dutch New Netherlands. It was actually settled by um, a woman 
from the Massachusetts Bay Colony who had a falling out with her Puritan elders. She was an aristocrat from England who um, had some pretty strong opinions about religious practice and, and had a falling out with John Winthrop in particular. And one did not have a falling out with John Winthrop and then just go home and have dinner. One tended to leave the colony. And so she uh, comes here. And this is a beautiful drawing of New Amsterdam, Lower Manhattan today, um, and is basically uh, welcomed by the Dutch. And frankly, the Dutch were, uh, this was a mercantile colony. They, they didn't really care what religion you practice as long as you contributed to the uh, colony in some way. And they needed people to farm the land, right? So they welcome Deborah Moody was her name and her her followers. And here's um, her settlement. And this is the earliest um, town planned and founded by a woman that we know of in North America. This is the exquisite little town plan. Uh, and this was also noteworthy because it was the, um, it was in its charter, religious freedom was was um, it was a, a guarantee, right? It was written into the charter. So it's actually one of the earliest examples of a place founded on principles of religious tolerance and freedom in, in the future United States. And you can actually see over time how this uh, little place evolves, right? This is from a 19th century atlas. And even today, right? Here's an aerial view. You can still see that you know, 250 year old, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, 300 odd year old, right? This was 1643, right? Um, and even some of these radiating uh, planting field lines, Lake Place and Avenue V are basically um, recalling that. Well, north of the Moraine, this is what you had, right? It was a little village. Um, on its way to becoming a small but booming and uh, ambitious city of Brooklyn, right? And right across from the East River. And there's a certain reciprocity that is important to understand here. You know, Brooklyn would never really have grown into the city that it became were it not for its adjacency to New York. So New York, you know, begat Brooklyn, if you will. Um, but Brooklyn uh, is essential to New York's growth, right? New York is a water-bound place. It's, it, it, Frederick Law Olmsted described it as, as uh, being in the, condition of a wall, in the condition of a walled city, right? It had no hinterland or minimal hinterland, and eventually that was all built up. Um, so without Brooklyn to feed it and take care of its many needs, as we'll see, um, New York would have essentially withered on the vine, right? So Brooklyn, there's this reciprocal relationship. Br Brooklyn feeds New York. And, um, you know, this the southern half of Brooklyn becomes a vast agricultural empire, right? Um, you have initially Dutch farmers like the Wyckoff family. This is the Wyckoff house down in, um, in, um, in, in um, uh, off Utica Avenue in, in Flatlands. It's one of the oldest, it's the oldest house in New York State and one of the oldest in the country. Um, and the, um, the lot house uh, in Marine Park, close to where I grew up in this building also still exists. These were basically vast plantations. And that word is, is apropos in another uh, sense because the Southern half of Brooklyn, this agricultural empire that was feeding the, the growth of New York, um, also had some of the highest uh, rates of uh, slavery outside of the Deep South. So it was, you know, I often refer to this part of Brooklyn as Deep South Brooklyn, but it, and that, that almost is a double entendre because it did have many um, commonalities uh, with the Deep South. Uh, and here, and this, it's incredible, but the um, agricultural production of Brooklyn, the southern half of Brooklyn, continues right up into the 1920s, almost into the 1930s. This is my neighborhood um, photographed from the air in, in 1924, right? This is just a few years later uh, from the same vantage point. In fact, the house I grew up in is this house right here where the cursor is. And you can see I was, you know, my house was basically in this, you know, 
built in this farm field, right? So this is, this is um, Brooklyn disposes of New York's waste, right? New, again, New York is a water bound place. It's like a, a fortress city and it had nowhere to dump its waste and there was plenty of waste and Brooklyn takes care of this too thus enabling the growth and development of New York and Manhattan, right? Um, this is a, a very early map showing Barron Island here and Barron Island becomes this great waste processing site uh, for all the trash and the carcasses of horses um, and other dead animals uh, from New York, right? This is where um, all the trash is, is, is processed into all sorts of products. It wasn't just dumped. I mean, they, you know, the, the, the animal carcasses were rendered down into, into soap, into the hair was used for brushes and uh, the bones for combs and for buttons and things like that. Um, and, um, and the garbage was, was compressed and steamed to, to um, produce some kind of extract that was used for fertilizers. This place was not a very pleasant place as, as this newspaper um, uh, uh, piece uh, suggests, right? <clears throat> Brooklyn also uh, is a place where, you know, the, the, uh, the dead are buried. Um, most famously, and, and I would say most pleasantly, at Greenwood Cemetery, right? Greenwood Cemetery is uh, built a, on the terminal moraine. It's actually the highest ground on the terminal moraine in Brooklyn. Um, and, uh, the, and, and this was important because the graveyards, the burial grounds in Manhattan by this time, by the 1830s and 40s were getting very overcrowded. And there was this real fear of um, you know, miasmas, as they were called, and, and, and disease, right? And of course, cholera was one of the worst. Um, so burying, uh, burials ex, um, began taking, a, taking place more and more across the East River in Brooklyn and eventually in Queens as well. Um, here's another view of Greenwood Cemetery, which is built during the great um, uh, rural cemetery movement uh, that begins with Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the 1830s. Um, this is, um, I'm sure some of you have been to Greenwood Cemetery. Um, the, it's open to the public now. I took this photo years ago when I was a student, a grad student at Cornell, and I actually had a a security officer take my camera, pull all the film out of it right in front of me. Um, fortunately, I'd already shot a couple of rolls because back then in the eight, up till the 90s, you weren't supposed to go in there and take photos of the gravestones, presumably because there were, the story was there were a bunch of, a lot of mobsters buried there who didn't want their, um, you know, names being circulated. Now, of course, they're like, Instagram us, come visit, you know. Um, Brooklyn is, of course, the great playground um, that enables, in a way, New York to um, function by serving as its great pressure release valve, right? The, the congestion, the density, the, the hyperactivity of New York, of Manhattan Island, um, is so extreme that you, you need a place to go to, to vent, to release your energy, to play, to be able to go back into the furnace, if you will, and work and live. And that of course um, is, is a, uh, it, it takes various forms over the decades in the 19th century in um, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, especially the Southern half of Brooklyn becomes this great playground uh, for New Yorkers, right? Um, Coney Island, Steeplechase Park was one of the, the three great parks that are built in, um, but this is Steeplechase Park was the first one. It was built in the late 19th century. Coney Island, I could give, you know, a whole semester's worth of lectures about Coney Island um, being that great pressure release valve and playground where all, all the, um, where, you know, your hair could be let down, where you can loosen the strictures of, of moral society and where all sorts of indulgences could be had um, that were untenable, um, you know, in the center city. 
Um, there were the great hotels built in Brighton Beach and elsewhere where people could come and play and gamble and, um, and, and bet on the horses, right? Uh, here's one of the last of these hotels. And these were enormous structures, all wood. Um, not a single one of them is left today. Uh, and then there was, you know, horse racing. There were three major racetracks in Southern Brooklyn, all in and around the Marine Park and Sheepshead Bay part of the city or, or part of Brooklyn. Uh, the Coney Island Jockey Club builds the greatest of these, um, this racetrack um, uh, that, um, where some of the great races of the 19th century took place, right? Um, uh, this is one of the most famous of these races um, between Pike Barnes and Tony Hamilton, both of whom, as you can see here, are African-American jockeys. And, and uh, riding um, thoroughbreds was actually one of the first um, major sports fields where African-Americans were uh, allowed to participate and, in fact, gained um, some real uh, distinction in before um, essentially Jim Crow kicks in and they are pretty much purged, but this is 1888. Um, and it's, it's very likely that the term, the big apple, ironically, can, is, is traceable to these um, racetracks and especially the, um, the, um, the uh, Sheepshead Bay racetrack that was built by the Coney Island Jockey Club. Um, the, you know, an apple was a treat that, um, the, the, the horses would get if they were behaving well and they raced well. <clears throat> Many of these, these um, uh, the hot walkers, the grooms, the, the, um, the men that took care of these animals were from the bluegrass country, Kentucky. Most of them were African-American. In fact, there's, there's the, even today, a tiny residual African-American community in and around Sheepshead Bay Gravesend that descends from these men who worked at these tracks, you know, over a hundred odd years ago. Um, and, and, and it's very likely that this is where the, um, that term, New York being the Big Apple, um, comes, um, comes from. And of course, baseball, and I'm not gonna get into this because this is, the bailiwick of many um, uh, folks that are have either spoken already today or on this um, call, but baseball too uh, is one of these um, pastimes that finds uh, fertile ground and, and, and sends forth deep roots in Brooklyn, especially the Brooklyn south of the terminal moraine, right? Uh, or right on the edge, right? You, you've got the Washington parks that were in a couple of locations in the Gowanus area and then Brownsville um, Eastern Park later on. Uh, and then Brooklyn is home, right? Brooklyn becomes the great um, bedroom community, the great, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the great rookery that um, in which New Yorkers uh, can live and raise families, right? And this really is stirred to life by um, a piece of infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, the, um, Robert Fulton's steam ferry, which uh, is the first to establish um, a regular, fast, reliable, scheduled ferry service between Lower Manhattan and Fulton Landing in Brooklyn. And this enables um, Brooklyn to become a commuter suburb, basically, right? So you have people from Lower Manhattan coming to uh, first Brooklyn Heights, right? This is what the Heights looked like prior to this. Right, it's very rural, um, and and over within a, a generation, you have it looking like this, right? Why? Because you can see the ferry boat here going from, um, you know, the basically downtown, you know, Lower Manhattan to Fulton Landing. All this down here is where Brooklyn Bridge Park is today. For those of you who are familiar with this part of the city, and this is um, Brooklyn Heights, right? And and of course, Brooklyn Heights develops over time into this wonderful neighborhood of these palatial brownstone townhouses. These are obviously some of the most sought after um, architecture in the city today, um, but this is a, the first suburb in a sense. And then of course the connection is more tightly um, uh, uh, finalized or, or um, made more firm by the building uh, of the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1883. 
this, uh, this really literally ties the fates of Brooklyn to uh, New York, right? And, um, and, and in, a, in many ways, this is the grand culmination of Brooklyn's own ambitions and its, its sense of itself. So confident is it in itself, so surging in terms of ambition and vision that it, it literally reaches out and joins itself to New York, right? To, um, to um, Manhattan. And it's not the New York Bridge, it is the Brooklyn Bridge. Although at, originally, as you could see here, it was called the Great New York and Brooklyn Bridge, but they, the Brooklynites were not having any of, of that. Um, and uh, you know, another example of <clears throat> the surging ambition of this place um, I said earlier that whatever New York had uh, or did, Brooklyn had to do one better, right? It's like that, the kid brother who's punching above its weight. And the best example of this is Prospect Park. New York builds Central Park. The leadership in, in Brooklyn turn, turn around and basically hire the same designer, Frederick Law Olmsted and his partner, Calvert Vox to uh, do Prospect Park. And, and frankly, Prospect Park, no offense to New Yorkers here, but Prospect Park is by far the uh, superior um, uh, uh, product in terms of design and, and the sculpting of the land. To be fair, the reason is it was a much more propitious site for the kinds of um, English romantic landscape um, you know, design that Olmsted and Vox were basically channeling toward, um, toward um, American cities. Uh, the Central Park site was a very difficult site. Um, very, you know, you, there were a lot of problems with. But here on the terminal moraine, you had deep soils and rolling terrain, and it really lent itself to this aesthetic. In any, in any case, this is a the, the great masterpiece of the Olmsted and Vox um, era of American urban park building. Uh, it was widely acknowledged by them that it was their greatest work. And I think most scholars of Olmsted and American urbanism would agree um, with that. There's Fred on the left. And, and Olmsted had an interesting career that I won't go into, but he, he actually, um, was a, 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 an accomplished journalist before he turned to landscape architecture and wrote a number of books. This one here, um, especially uh, influential in, in terms of uh, opening the eyes of um, Northerners to the horrors of uh, slavery in the, um, in the uh, Southern states. When I said that, you know, this was the um, the more um, the, the the far more sophisticated uh, work of the Olmsted Vox firm, uh, it 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 also is the first example of where Olmsted uses the park as a generator of an open space system to basically bring a degree of civilizing order to this still rural agricultural landscape. And the, the mechanism by which he does this are these great avenues, these great boulevards that we refer to today as parkways, although it's confusing because it's slightly different type of parkway than the, the, the 1920s and 30s motor parkways like the Bronx River and Hutchinson River Parkway. Um, but here you see a, a, a drawing of a cross section of, of Eastern Parkway. And these were modeled um, very much on the Parisian boulevards that he actually went and studied, right? And you can see here, Brooklyn's chain of parkways. And this was the first example in the United States of a regional, a metropolitan wide open space system, right? Um, and you can see, again, it's, this was his kind of precedent. This is one of the boulevards in Paris. And you can see that he uses these to basically bring a degree of order to project this, this ordering system onto Brooklyn um, and especially the still rural parts of Brooklyn. It was his vision that these grand avenues, these parkways would become generators of real estate development. Right, so that you would have on either side of Ocean Parkway, either side of Eastern Parkway or 
Fort Hamilton Park, you would have all these beautiful homes and neighborhoods being developed, right? That would, um, that would civilize the countryside. Um, the, Just a few minutes left. Okay. Um, you know, not all of them were built. This, was, this is the uh, Verrazano Narrows crossing. Fort Hamilton Parkway was supposed to lead to a park here. Of course, that's where we have the, the bridge today. That is built, but not as a parkway. It's just a kind of grubby motor road today. But um, Ocean Parkway is driven straight south to Coney Island, and that's a beautiful road today, well used by people. And, and it also has the first, um, really the first designed um, bikeways in the country. You can see here, Brooklyn cyclists expect to have model path, right? It's um, along Ocean Parkway. Uh, here's a, a unit of the uh, Brooklyn Police Department riding on their bicycles um, down. And then the, um, the, the third of these is Eastern Parkway, which drove straight east from Grand Army Plaza. Um, this is what it looked like early on with the elm trees which are mostly dead now. And then um, here's what it looks like today, right? And this was meant to be, um, it, it was actually joked of in the press that uh, why not extend that boulevard all the way east and basically, um, you know, make Long Island a great um, vestibule to Brooklyn and part of this grand gateway uh, to uh, America. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to skip these, but, um, uh, and then I'll end with this because uh, this, this grand culmination of, of projects and ambition, um, it leads up to 1898. I, I won't go into the mechanics of the decision to join the greater city here, um, but it was, uh, it had a lot to do with um, debt and a need for uh, municipal water. But in any case, it was recalled as the so-called great mistake for many um, years afterward by many um, people. And I still I remember even growing up as a child hearing that from older Brooklynites. Um, if you want to read more about all this, there's my book. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, there's my um, Twitter handle. So thank you. Professor, thank you so much. <laughs> really. I, I I can't tell you how much I enjoyed the book. I, I do have Thank this. Uh, I, here's David Dyke right away saying, excellent. <laughs> and he's a Brooklynite. <laughs> Great. So me, um, yeah, if, if, if there are any, um, you know, if yeah, there are any me. questions, I'd be happy to, 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 and thank you guys for the, um, for the compliments, but yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, we have a few. We have a few and a few comments. Okay. Uh, it starts right off with somebody saying they, they played little league baseball in, uh, in Marine in, Mar in Marine Park, and uh, was uh, it? Uh, what's the name of the league there? I'm trying to remember. Oh, it was a little league team. Let's see. Yeah, there's a very famous little league team. Um, somebody, go ahead. You'll have to unmute yourself again. Who had? Posted that about playing little league baseball and uh... oh, is it not not Pop Warner? I can't remember. Um, Joe, well, it's the there's the Joe Turi um, league because Joe Turi actually grew up in my neighborhood. Right, right. Joe Turi's son was in my my class at at um, at Good Shepherd um, the elementary school. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um... Murray Bouchard, again, great, uh, very enjoyable. Tom, thank you, and interesting. Uh, Peter Gordon, wonderful pitches. Well, the, the, book, the book is likewise. <laughs> it was great, thanks for the presentation. I love the slides, so especially the maps, which is, were, were intriguing in the book also. I played the North, oh, here it is. I played in the North Highway Little League. Yeah, that's it, North Highway. My brother was in that, North Highway. Oh, there you go, <laughs> okay. I was trying to remember that, that, yeah, North Highway. You know, sooner or later, you, you know, you just uh, end up with somebody uh, uh, from Brooklyn, <laughs> inevitably in, in, in the audience for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, wish I could take one of your uh, courses, excellent. Thank you, that was from uh, Penelope C. And uh, John Thorne, uh, also says an outstanding outstanding Tom to you. So uh, you know we I, I I thank you so oh 
By the way, the Boston Public Library does not have your book. Wow. Boston <laughs> Public Library? The Boston Public Library, Penelope said. She tried to read it, I guess. Uh, well, maybe you can request them to, uh, to yeah, order. That, that's it. Uh, by the way, I mean, you kind of just very simply what I did. I mean, I, I have a favorite bookstore in town that I had them, you know, get this for me uh, because I, you know, I support that local bookstore. But uh, I would say that, uh, I mean, Amazon, of course, you know, has it. And there's also a paperback version, right? It's, uh, uh, <laughs> it's paperback and hardcover, right? Yeah. I like Tom Gilbert's comment there. Oh, where is Boston? <laughs> where, where is Boston? <clears throat> is that out by, is that past Queens? <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's out that way. <laughs> it's out that way. <laughs> Near the Great Gateway, that's right. <laughs> you know, uh, so having the combination of you at Ithaca and, and Brooklyn is, is really, really a, a, a good I gave um, I, I gave a talk on, on, my, on my book, the fall that it came out, you know, the fall before the fall, before the <laughs> pandemic. And, and um, the, at the um, Tompkins County Historical Society, and, and I, I, there must have been, the room was packed. There must have been about 30 or 40 people with, from Brooklyn. Um, in the yeah. room, who, who live here in Ithaca now. That's great, That's wonderful. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, we greatly appreciate you joining us and uh, adding so much to the uh, to the discussion about nineteenth century and uh, at plus Brooklyn, yeah, you nineteenth know, century and earlier. Well, thank, thank you. you. It, was, it was fun to uh, it was fun to to contribute. And you're welcome to stay on if you yeah, like. Yeah, I, I think I will. Yeah. Okay.